Smith, we're going to get started now. And please feel free to sit at the table up front if you want. If anybody wants to sit at the table to take notes or. My name is Scott Polikoff. I'm with the Gateway Planning, and uh, uh, this is the uh, report out meeting for the uh, workshop we've been undertaking the last couple of days. So uh, let's see. We we have some elected officials here. I uh, want to make sure I don't uh, slide anybody. Right, uh, Paul? Anybody else? Nope. Um, so, I know that we probably have a few folks that haven't been here before, so I'm going to do a, just a brief summary of why we're here, and then we're going to collectively all present the results of our work the last 48 hours, and, and uh, happy to get your feedback. Um, uh, the Gateway Planning is the lead team, but it's really been a collaborative with uh, Market Feasibility Advisors, uh, those gentlemen who are here with us. The first part of the workshop have now left, but they've been providing us background analysis and input. Uh, they're experts on the uh, uh, opportunity of uh, natural uh, destinations, lakes, uh, zoos, um, all sorts of uh, related uses. Um, Peter Ravella Consulting, and we have Peter and Anna. Uh, they specialize in waterfront planning, permitting, programming. Uh, Peter was the former director of the coastal program for the state of Texas. Uh, the River Studio with uh, Roy Mann and Johanna Arendt. Um, uh, uh, Roy is a, uh, 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 a very well accomplished uh, waterfront designer. And in fact, uh, one of the projects you might know of is he conceived of, catalyzed the Bricktown uh, project in Oklahoma City. And uh, then our team, uh, Milosaw Sekic, uh, Rob Parsons, and Brad Lomberger. So you can see there's this long list of elements of the plan that we're supposed to undertake. And without going through the detail of this, um, there is a technical aspect where our work will be an update to the city's comprehensive plan. Uh, you're going to see all of these elements uh, in different places in the work that we've done over the last couple of days, which was a culmination of really focusing on how to uh, capture an appropriate market for future opportunities around the lake uh, in the context of what I call resolving complex community interests. The lake is a series of neighborhoods. It's not just uh, uh, a recreation, uh, a resort lake, or a fishing lake, uh, but it's also a, it's a neighborhood lake. Um, our focus is really designing for implementation. Uh, if what you see today is not realistic, then we've not done a job that is meaningful. Uh, and I think the final point is that our approach is really focusing on locals as tourists. And what I mean by that is, uh, are we first and foremost serving uh, the local community in whatever we're proposing? Uh, there is a tremendous opportunity though. Uh, this is already a regional and a national destination, so we want to build on that in a way that's also consistent with uh, the local interest. Um, the slide says a stable and growing market. I think as things accelerate with the uh, shale play, um, the, maybe stable is not quite the right word. Uh, so. Uh, this is a this is quite a growing market, but what we want to make sure we do is whatever we propose uh, takes advantage of this growth, but not in a way that's unrealistic. When the what is going to be somewhat of a of a temporary, although it might be several years, not just a uh, short term, but it, clearly it will still be a temporary uh, 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 increase in economic activity. You've you've always been a stable economy, but it's certainly very strong right now because of that too. Uh, the initial analysis that was done by our colleagues at MFA really showed that there's a very strong, even just local, uh, demand for uh, active recreation. 
uh, which is still being underserved currently at, at the lake in terms of the, the lake's capacity, its infrastructure capacity, and its programming. But more broadly, we really do view this as an economic development opportunity. Uh, in some quarters, economic development is viewed as something for those people, for out-of-town investors, but really for a community to be vital and for the city council and uh, the voters. Uh, you have an election coming up, so I'm going to talk in those terms for the city council and the voters to be in a position to continue to make wise choices for investing your limited resources. Uh, part of our challenge is creating a context in which uh, those resources can be invested wisely. So it, it, it is essentially an economic development exercise in many respects. Uh, in that context, though, uh, one of the admonitions we've heard from you repeatedly, and, and, and we agree completely, is whatever we propose has to be uh, uh, consistent with the ability for reinvestment, uh, for life cycle cost replacement, for keeping uh, the resource clean, uh, for managing uh, the lake as an asset. Uh, and so uh, that may not have anything to do with economic development. That's just good stewardship. And we understand that those two can go hand in hand. Most importantly, what's exciting is, is that you just think about the potential partnerships. They're already de facto in play. Uh, the city is, is partners with all the other public institutions. But what we think is that we can help create a, uh, a, a plan uh, to take that to the next level in terms of uh, Angelo State. Uh, the Air Force, uh, the other state agencies, uh, and the other local entities. And uh, we know that there's some uh, challenging issues, and I think we've come up with some potential solutions. Uh, this presentation is not going to be a silver bullet, but I, I think you'll see some ideas that we think might be able to uh, resolve what now is viewed as a conflict and, and create uh, some harmony between the interest of those that live in the lake area and the residents in the broader community that come and use, use it as a recreational destination. So um, this has been an exercise in, I think, substantial engagement in the community. If you look at this slide, you can see all the notes that we've been collecting. Now, this is not a comprehensive set of notes, but uh, we've been carrying around this map in all our conversations that, in, in, that Peter and uh, and in fact, have been really spearheading. Uh, and uh, what you see on this map represents a lot of insight, a lot of input. And I think it's really uh, uh, the genesis of uh, a lot of the rest of what you're going to see. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn this over to, to uh, Peter and Anna to explain uh, kind of what we heard in a uh, logical way and so we can relate it to the potential programming and opportunities both in terms of what's already going on at the lake and what could uh, be uh, uh, added and complement what's already going on. Thank you Scott. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, I really appreciate participation. Um, as Scott mentioned, Peter and I have been kind of on the end of compiling community information, input from citizens, and so we want to kind of talk about what we found um, during, we had some meetings about a month ago, um, over two days, and so we want to kind of share that information that we found with you all. Thank you. Um, so as you mentioned before, I'm Anna Mackey. I work with Peter. I, I'm a project manager for Park Consulting. So as you see here, we have, this is kind of our recreation activity list as, as we saw people kind of, we ranked it based on what people mentioned during the time that we spent talking to people. And what we learned is that there's a lot going on out at the lake already, which I'm sure all of you know. So as you can see, it's kind of ranked. Um, we, we put it in terms of non-motorized upland activities, motorized water sports, and non-motorized water sports. So. You can kind of look at that information, but um, we want to be able to take what we've learned and make sure that we're really implementing it into what we come up with as a team. So with that, I'll turn it over to Peter to kind of go over some other things that we found. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. Uh, my name is Peter Ravella, proud team member and really happy to be in San Angelo working with this fine community. Uh, 
Yeah, it was interesting. You know, we did about, we've probably, con concluding this week, probably conducted more than 50 interviews and, and had some pretty serious uh, time and discussions with folks in the community. So for many of I see in the audience who spent time and uh, with us, we want to thank you for sharing your thoughts and concerns and insights. And I do want to emphasize on this community input is when you walk into a community like this and you're from out of town and you think, well, we're coming to work on a lake plan, uh, we were surprised to learn that there is as much going on around the lake, in fact, probably more than going on on the lake. And these, uh, these recreational activities on the land, the, the, the trail, of course, the, the uh, gun club hill uh, activity is substantial. This great trail system that is sort of partially there around the lake, but highly used, the camping, that's opportunities at the lake. There's a lot going on. So what we tried to do was, was make sure that the planners, our job was really to make sure we talked a lot with the community and make sure our, the planning team had a good understanding of the input from y'all. So you try to compile as many opinions as we got. It's a little tricky. So we came up with, uh, Gateway came up with this very interesting spectrum. I really like this to present a variety of viewpoints. And the first one that we, what we sort of categorically work us is what we're calling the identity of the lake. So when you think about Lake Nasworthy, what identity do you think about? What comes to mind for you as a general matter? Uh, and we've put a quote on each one of these. In this particular case, one of the folks we were working with really emphasize the unique opportunity to fill the needs in the way that complements the city's history, the landscape, the West Texas uh, country character. We heard a lot about this as a West Texas lake and what that means in the planning for this, that it's an arid region. We're a West Texas community. We're not a, it's not Houston, it's not Dallas, it's and it's dry. And that told us a lot about the identity of the lake. So on, on and I'll tell you, this slide is, to me, one of the most important things that we learned. When you look at this spectrum over on the far right, you'll see what we learned about the assets of the lake. What is the strength of the lake? What do people love about it? What does it provide that they care about? So one of the things you hear is, you know, what's great about Lake Nasworthy is that it's a managed, constant water lake in West Texas in a dry region, and that's a unique thing to have. And Yes, yeah, so, so at one end you'll have assets on the far right end, and on the left you're going to have the challenges, what are the issues surrounding the lake. So on the far right, one of the things is this asset, the strength of the lake, if you will, is the fact that it is a constant level lake. Now, we heard that strongly, and the flip side of that immediately, which is, yeah, that's what it's supposed to be, but will it remain? a constant level lake, what is the water system? So the number one challenge on the far left end of the spectrum is the uncertain water level, the current drought conditions, the low water in Twin Buttes Reservoir. What does it mean to the town to look at the future of this lake with this uncertainty sitting there? And I think if you, if you listen to the city council and the community discussion, of course it's clear to us this is a major issue in the community. So two ends of the spectrum. Uh, the other parts of the complexity of the lake itself as a physical feature, not just the water level, not just O.C. Fisher or Twin Buttes and the relationship between those unfortunate uh, reservoirs, is also the issue of sedimentation in the lake and the dredging problem, right? The, t the, the community's $10 million investment in the last 10 years to take about, what, three and a half million cubic yards out of the lake. We have a fairly shallow lake, about six foot average, shallower in many areas. The sedimentation issue uh, it is, is a runoff issue. It's a stormwater management issue for the adjacent areas, and it also has to do with the, with the nature of the shoreline itself, right? Is it a bulkheaded, armored shoreline, natural areas? How much runoff and sediment is entering into the lake? These physical elements, the challenges on the far left end are critical, right? It's the first thing you encounter when you think about Lake Nasworthy. What 
we want to say to the town, and I think we'll recommend in the, in the, in the report, is the technical resolution of these things is a separate but critical exercise the town has to go through. What you're talking about here is a serious engineering feasibility analysis to look at the long-term costs of maintaining that water level, potential sources, tough question, right? How to handle that dredging cost over the long term, where does the material go, and how to work on the shoreline conditions and also the stormwater runoff. All of that body of technical, scientific, engineering analysis needs to be undertaken while this process is going on or as the town moves forward with its long-term plan. We see those as the significant major issues at the left end of the spectrum. So as you go a little further into the middle, uh, great asset about the lake, high activity, at this lake, it's highly used. Uh, the attraction for events, it's not just the drag boat races. There are other events associated with the lake, the triathlons. There's a number, actually, a pretty extensive list of events. There's a very diverse recreational base on this lake. Hiking, biking, walking, you know, boating, fishing, many. Diverse recreation, great, on the asset side. Boating and boat ramps are pretty good in number. They are not great in condition. And that has to do, of course, with the fluctuating water level and the decline in the water level and the extension or the necessity to extend the ramps. So the boat ramps are both pretty good boat access, not great boat or uh, ramp conditions. Uh, high property values along the lakes, great asset to the community. Uh, but when you get further to the left here, poor boat ramp conditions, conflict between motorized and non-motorized watercraft on the lake. It's a small body of water, doesn't have a great surface area. Kayakers, canoe, there's some folks who like to kayak and canoe and sail, but you've also got a lot of watercraft and a lot of jet ski usage, particularly uh, on the other side of the bridge. So these are some of the, when you take the whole community discussion, this is an attempt to identify this category of issues. And we've got three of these. Uh, this one has to do with development improvements. What should change about the lake? What did we hear from the crowd? Uh, by the way, when you look at the number of hash marks, uh, it tells you something about how many people talked about these particular issues. So it gives you a sense of scale. In this case, we're going to look at development that is both privately oriented or beneficial and publicly oriented, or the two ends of the spectrum. On the far right, something like putting in a bar or a restaurant or increased residential housing, either multifamily or single family, whatever form, concessions, retail, all of that is a private development aspect of what could happen around the lake on the right side. Hotel, marina, these are not necessarily things that the community would directly invest in. It's not something where your Lake Nasworthy Fund would go build a hotel. You might build roads or infrastructure that support private development or investment, but this is really some amenities that are, have to be financially viable and functional around the lake to be to attract a private investor to do that. So as you go towards the middle, you get into some things that are both public and private beneficial. What about a boardwalk area around the Mary Lee Park corner? If there was a shorefront boardwalk, it might be a great trail, essentially, or walking space, kind of public but kind of private. Entertainment spaces, something like the pavilion when you think about what is an entertainment space. Well, we know the pavilion over there is used for music and rented and kind of public, kind of private. Uh, and then you get into this middle part of the development issues that relate strongly to infrastructure. You think about roadways and accesses to the lake. You think about the condition of boat ramps. You can think about the restrooms and the, and the quality of the restrooms around the lakes, the pavilions around the lake, the water and the sewer system around the lake, the existence of some septic and some sewer, right? All of these infrastructure parts are critical to the future of the lake that are going to serve both a public interest and a private interest. So in the center, we heard, you'll see a lot of hash marks in the center of this spectrum because a lot of folks emphasize to us 
the condition of the general infrastructure of the lake. Roads, restrooms, boat ramps, those kinds of things. In other words, improving and maintaining the facilities that you have that function at the lake. As you get down to the far left here, you start to get into the kind of public interest improvements that we heard a lot about. And I can tell you, trails, paths, playgrounds, parks, the beach. Free public recreational amenities, they tend to be more upland oriented and they're very important. When you go back up a couple of slides and you look at the tallest green over there has to do with the trail use and people recreating around the lake, not necessarily on the lake. So we took from this a pretty strong emphasis of, yeah, general interest in seeing some private amenity improvements out there. A restaurant would be great. A place to pull your boat up into a, a tie-up dock or a small marina area to get out, have a, a burger and a beer, or have a drink with your wife, or enjoy a sunset. Would be a great asset to the lake. Uh, but we also think not to overlook the fundamental issues with the infrastructure around the lake and the physicality, the physical water level sedimentation issues around the lake are equally important. Okay, last one, access and mobility. There's a long comment here that we excerpted that came out of one of the workshops that came in an email to us. I won't identify the person, although I think everybody in this room probably knows who it is. But the, this was a great point of view, and we liked it. Uh, this person said, a carefully planned public-private partnership is the goal that results in a functional blend of improved lakes access and supporting infrastructure for residents. Great way to say that, yes. We say, yes, that's a great way to discuss that. We'll see that in what we're trying to do. Open space, green belt areas. Yes, we agree that's an critical part based on the conversations we've had. Selectively approved economic development activities by private investors that do not negatively impact existing recreational activities for San Angelo residents. Very well said. This guy's got it down, right? And non-motorized connectivity enhancements that mitigate the motorized vehicle track. But this is a trail point of view. Uh, we also like. And promoting increased physical activity on the part of residents and visitors. I mean, this is a great mission statement, right? Uh, so we were very happy to get that email. It sort of en encapsulated so much of what we, we thought, too. So in this one on access and mobility, far right end, high impact access and mobility act activities versus low impact is kind of the spectrum. So you're looking at things on the far right, the Knickerbocker Road traffic flow improvements. Traffic around that corner is important. What is that going to be like if there's a lot more cars going through there? Uh, road access to Middle Concho and Spring Creek. The area where the jet boat races are staged is not an easy place to get to. Everybody's got to go down the residential roads. There's a lot of pressure uh, on the road, on the uh, lakeside road system. If that area is going to be an event area, how's the access there? Uh, the limitations on fishing roads we talked about, a huge one, resolve, improve, preserve, put the right verb in there for your point of view, the gun club trail and street issue. They gotta, we got to figure out something better than what's there. Great area, really popular. We don't see moving people off of gun club hill. It is what it is. It's very popular for specific reasons. It can be done in a safer way. The town's done some really good work on this already. We're moving in the direction of some of the stuff that you've already seen, but Gun Club Hill, huge. And then this integrate the trails and roadways uh, around the lake. There's an incomplete trail system. There's a great city plan, pretty solidly done. We've tried to incorporate and build on that. So we see that kind of as a, again, sort of in the infrastructure mode about the importance of trails and biking. Uh, 5K, 10K runs, off-road biking, mountain biking, a lot of input there. Uh, and so, and there's been a little discussion about equestrian trails. So uh, I would just say at the end of the day, access and mobility concerns around the lake, both pedestrian, bike, and vehicle, 
need to be a, a key part of the plan. So with that, I'm going to say we're going to look and see how the framework tackled some of these questions. So I want to say thanks to everybody who spent time helping us understand your area. Appreciate it. Um, as you can see, we took very seriously your input, uh, analyzed it, and I think you'll see it's, it's incorporated. We've, we went through this a little bit a couple days ago, so I'm not going to go through it in much detail, but effectively the framework is these different character zones. Uh, the purple, we're calling the special opportunity. Maybe someday that'll be named. Uh, part of it's Gun Club Hill, it's the power plant, but we see that as one location. It really needs to be viewed together, and you'll see why in a sec. Um, what we're calling the action sports area, it's if you see the orange around the shoreline on the western side of the lake, we didn't color in much of the upland because it's really the activity that's related directly to the water. Um, uh, the area, the green on the north and south side of the action sports, what we're calling the nature education zone, uh, and we're going to talk about some detail on that in a sec. Uh, the the, the uh, more teal green on the right, the community activity area, uh, and then you'll see in the yellow throughout, those are the neighborhoods. Uh, and this exercise actually helped us really understand how the lake already is functioning so that we're not starting from some ideal that we brought to the table. We're starting from the point of what's actually going on. Um, we don't have a, a detailed planning uh, uh, element yet for the community activity area, but I'd like Johanna for a second because we're getting ready to go into some detail to talk briefly about what some of the potential is, and then uh, uh, we still have work to do, and we're gonna develop some detail for that area, but Johanna, if you wanna explain a little bit about what's envisioned for that area, that'd be great. Sure, so um, as I'm sure you all know, there's a lot already going on there. It's a very natural, beautiful area, a uh, very varied shoreline. Um, and one of the things that we noticed there that maybe hasn't been taken advantage of as much as it could have is there's an old fish hatchery um, that is no longer in use but is, has a, a lot of depressed areas um, that could be used to collect stormwater um, and turn into wetlands. And that would be a great asset to the ecology of the lake. There are some wetlands around, but that would be a, a really large solid chunk um, and that is actually very attractive to a number of bird species, which would be great for the ecology, great for local birders, and also a draw for birders from all over. Um, as you may know, people who are interested in, in bird watching will come, will travel great distances to get the bird checked off on the list that they are looking for. And there could be some great opportunities. We would need to look further at the existing structures between the ponds, but um, there could be ways to access it through pathways or boardwalks or just turn it into a really nice area to go and have a quiet afternoon looking at the nature. Um, and another thing that's happening in that area that we're anticipating is um, the, the Parks Department in their plan had shown a trail system going down there and I think that's a great way to connect the river uh, coming from the lake, the pavilion area down to the south, the, um, the kayaking and windsurfing and all the boating that comes off the shore and also that potential uh, birding area where the fish hatchery is um, because that is another way you could drive there but now you could also bike there or walk there as well. Um, it's just there's a lot going on ecologically at this lake and I think that would be a really great addition. We're going to provide some detail uh, on that uh, as part of our final uh, report. Um, obviously what you all have been talking about a lot, I think Peter underscored how this uh, uh, element, the integrated trail, the trail is probably the primary piece but it's really an integrated uh, access system. Uh, and so Brad's going to talk a little bit more about that in terms of how we envision this unfolding. Thanks, Scott. Uh, so as you can see on, on this plan here, the green line is actually uh, an integrated loop system around the park, around the lake itself, uh, integrating with various uh, parks, uh, in a, which are actually you can't see them too well, but it's a, a green shaded area along the trail system. Uh, at each of these various areas, there's little trailheads with uh, the black dot 
And those trailheads would actually serve as meeting points where there can be a congregated collection of bikers or hikers or cyclists or any of uh, mountain bikers or any kind of folk and uh, that are using the trail. And I'm going to actually zoom in on one of them right up here near where uh, uh, the archery and disc golf and, and uh, the Stillwater uh, restaurant is. So as you can see, um, we tried to create a low impact trailhead feature, which actually integrates into the existing uh, community. It doesn't utilize or require any new structures. It just uh, tries to integrate some sort of parking, which we've included on city land. Uh, it actually uh, it includes, you know, flag poles and maps of the actual map of the actual area and this one specifically is a great area for a trailhead because you have the Stillwater restaurant you also have an event and wedding center at the at the pavilion and those two working together with some parking oh thanks uh, you can't see it okay okay oh well um uh, those two working together can actually serve as a uh, gathering spot for other events, such as if the archery were to, which you've heard they may be uh, hosting a national archery tournament, they would actually be able to ho host and, and, and gather closer to where the restaurant and the pavilion are to actually help feed those existing businesses and then walk along a trail system and picnic along a trail system and just use the archery fields themselves for archery and then a lot of the engagement and activity would actually take place closer to businesses that already exist same with the disc golf if they were ever to hold larger competitions they would gather at the parking area and at the trailheads where there's more of a plaza and entertainment and then the restaurant and the pavilion could work together to cater for these services and actually provide meeting space and gathering space which actually would help their businesses as well You know, if anybody has a, a comment or a question or two, I, I don't want to take too long because we need to get through and we've, we've scheduled this to end at 6 or 6.30. I'm sorry. 7. 7. So we've got time. Okay. So if there's, if there's, um, if there's uh, a comment or a question or two about what you've seen so far, if you'd like to uh, come forward or we can take this at the end. No? Okay. We'll, we'll keep going then. So uh, Roy's going to talk a little bit. Roy and Johanna is going to—they're going to talk a little bit about uh, what we conceive of as a potential heritage and interpretive center uh, that could really bring a lot of different things together uh, in terms of taking advantage of the natural asset and the cultural and community engagement uh, that the lake attracts. Thank you, Scott. Well, it's been really a pleasure and an honor to be at work here in San Angelo on Lake Nasworthy. Uh, it's really a fascinating resource, and it offers thoughts on how you as a community might move forward, not only for your own benefit, but for the interest of people for miles and miles around, let's call it a whole region. Uh, let me just refer to uh, uh, a similar community question. In a town much smaller than San Angelo, Canyon, Texas, of some years ago, uh, one woman in 1960, after reading a Reader's Digest article about a playwright who was going around the country writing a play about interesting and interesting region's heritage, then going on to some other region in the United States, doing the same thing, writing a play about that particular region's heritage. And she got really interested and invited uh, that guy out uh, to Canyon, and they looked at Palo Duro Canyon together. And he got very excited, and she was encouraged, and she began to get more and more people in Canyon signed on to helping put together um, a new play about West Texas uh, and Palo Duro Canyon. And that play, of course, was called Texas. And I'm sure many of you have seen that story of Texas, a very wonderful, 
high styled, very exciting demonstration of what Texas is all about. I'm convinced that you can do the very same thing here. That's not the only thing we're recommending. This is kind of the tail end of it, but it's kind of an exciting tale, so I thought I'd mention it up front. The point is this, that if you are asked the question, what is San Angelo's claim to fame? That question leads to whether you are confident that San Angelo can mount new stories and get the wave moving and bring more and more of your young kids to become interested in the history and the heritage and the future of San Angelo. So by um, putting together something like this, again, this is the tail end, you may not do it, but I think it kind of underscores the value of talking about heritage and showing your own pride in your own legacy. And when you can do that and show that to others, big things begin to happen. So, let me talk now about the uh, particular site where some of your heritage might be addressed and spoken of and sung about. This is the old power plant site, and uh, it is very transformed from that power plant and its surroundings, as you can see. Uh, I don't, uh, let's see, is this the pointer? Uh -huh. Okay, well, let's, yeah, let's just uh, look at the center uh, where you can, uh, uh, there's kind of a square with four spokes, and that is just above uh, two uh, irregular uh, rectangles uh, just below it, uh, close to the... Uh, Roy, do you want me to point out? There's one right here. Oh, okay, I didn't realize that. Yeah, you can, here, well, this, will let, this way you can... Yeah, I'm sorry. because there, you have a picture here. This might help you too. Uh, very good, very good. Might, yeah. Folks, I'm not as prepared as I should be, but thankfully Peter's around often enough. Okay, very good. Yeah, but uh, all righty, very good, very good. This is just a rehearsal, folks. Come tomorrow. Yeah, come here. <laughs> come here. Right, here, right there. Thank you. See okay, that? You Don't touch it. Just move it. Yeah, got it. Got it. All right. There you go. All right. Sorry. Thank you, friends. <laughs> I said I have to rely on Peter often. I have to rely on Scott too because uh, otherwise I'm lost. Don't click anything, just move it. There yep. you go. <laughs> okay, this is the site of the old power plant itself. Actually, it goes beyond that. Uh, but uh, the smokestacks are here and all. Now, there is um, uh, a party that has purchased the property uh, from WTU, and uh, they, as we understand, are interested in selling it. Uh, further. Uh, I won't get into that mechanism, uh, but the point is this, that we hope that some of the power plant structure, the more interesting parts, might be retained. There are all kinds of interesting parts, not the outside wall, not many of the staircases, let's say, not even the smokestacks. But if you ever get inside of a power plant, you do come across some very, very fascinating structures and they help tell the story of energy generation. That was a gas-fired power plant. And now we're into all kinds of other energy sectors. Fracking and gas and oil shale, uh, wind power, and so on. And San Angelo happens to be right in the middle of all of that, figuratively, uh, and partially geographically as well. So if you can think of this site as talking of the heritage of San Angelo. Uh, then we can talk about one of perhaps six or seven categories of heritage right here at the power plant, and that is energy. So by saving certain parts of that power plant and then uh, elaborating and talking about other forms of energy, that San Angelo has in its heritage and in its future, uh, you can make a strong drawing card that will be of great interest to your own people here in the city and to people for miles and miles around. I think I used that phrase before. Now there's another uh, component of heritage that's very important here in uh, San Angelo. I'm not doing this in any particular order, 
but your recreational resources have always been part of uh, lake activity and uh, a residential settlement around the lake. Uh, they also draw many people around so that if we and you decide that it is worthwhile recommending, you'll have more action sports, more powerboarding races, and lots of other things, even sailing competitions when the wind is up and all. So that is one other component of heritage, heritage to think about. A third is water itself. The lake, the river, all of that uh, spells W-A-T-E-R. And water has become increasingly important in the life of Texas, as you know, not simply for recreational reasons, but for the availability of potable water, uh, the availability of water for all other uses. And so uh, water itself, its supply, the future in terms of climate change and all, and the ability to conserve water and so forth are powerful stories. If you can have that interpreted at a, an interpretive center here, again, this will appeal to many people. You will have university classes come by, high school classes come by, and all, and so you can um, really tell the story of water and what the challenges will be for West Texas and Texas as a whole in the future. In terms of water, yeah. yeah. You could, if you could indicate yeah. how that right. relates to the interpreter. Yeah. Thank you. I, I was about to get into that. So one of the ways to demonstrate what water is all about is to talk about the Concho River system itself. And we have a model shown here of the Concho River. It really doesn't take the bends and the straits that you actually have, but it's a way of teaching kids, <laughs> teaching adults, teaching everyone. Uh, what uh, a river system is all about. They have a model of this kind uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, actually on Mud Island, which is out in the middle of the Mississippi. It draws thousands and thousands of visitors every year. It's about a mile long. This is not nearly uh, even half a mile long, but it, it has all of the excitement of a river in terms of water flow and so on. So perhaps the same thing might be done here. Now, also, we have uh, the intake channel, which is not really suitable for uh, boat access from the lake into the channel and back out because of the low clearance of Knickerbocker Road Bridge there. Uh, but it does offer the opportunity to say much about water too. So that can also play a role. Um, we think that planting good trees along the edge and having uh, interesting facilities and nature along the edges of this channel uh, will also be an attraction that it doesn't now have. Uh, the same thing can happen on the outlet channel where the hot water discharge used to take place and which, of course, uh, made a trophy fish possible and uh, hot water slough park uh, reachable. Uh, the other parts are the um, uh, interpretive center itself here, and the arena on an upper slope, upper slope just above this circle area. That would have a stage. That would be the arena where your version of uh, your comparable uh, counterpart to the Texas show in Polydor Canyon might take place. I would hope that someone or a group of people uh, here in the audience tonight might think about this in some creative way and figure whether you think it's possible or not possible. I would like to hear back from you. The um, uh, next um, slide shows uh, several uh, possible names for the center. This is just throwing out ideas and words uh, for your consideration. Celebration San Angelo, the Great Concha Rivers Adventure, or the San Angelo Heritage Adventure. Maybe you'll have ideas too that we would welcome that would suggest a different direction here. Um, also, the themes, I spoke through some of these. I'll just sum them up again quickly. Uh, water in West Texas, uh, your regional economy, energy resources and environmental sustainability, river and lake recreation, 
cultural and historic legacies, which include, of course, Fort Concho, uh, the Black Cavalry, known as the Buffalo Soldiers, uh, and all of the other wonderful things you have in your history. Environmental resources and sustainability as well. That particular image there is of a heritage interpretive museum that we planned for Buffalo, New York. Uh, they've built the Naval History Museum first that we recommended right there on the Buffalo River. And uh, this is next, just about to be done. And the outcomes are so important. Uh, first of all, with uh, all age appeal and regional interest, heritage tourism will be, as we mentioned before, a strong drawing card. Um, the main benefits really are your own civic pride and the economic benefit that comes from uh, the drawer that this will generate, the restaurants that will be served, the motels and hotels that will serve as lodging for all of the visitors. And publicizing San Angelo's unique assets to the U.S. Southwest uh, is so important for you. Uh, you need to have that outreach. This particular image is of a, a heritage interpretive center, actually an educational center on uh, the environment of El Cielo Biosphere Reserve, a UN designated uh, biosphere reserve up in Tamaulipas, the edge of the Sierra Madre Oriental. And that's become a huge success. It's right on the ecotourism corridor there and all good things are happening there as well. And uh, nature education itself. Uh, Johanna, I'm sorry. Hold on one second. So before we move on to that, though, I, 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 do, I do think there are some interesting things that can be woven together. Um, you know, just uh, Nasworthy himself and the tie to uh, the, the history, the equestrian history and, and uh, the history of military and, and Navy, the Navy connections, ironically, with the body, body, of, wadi, body of water here. Um, so uh, our, our point in bringing this forward is not to specifically program the Heritage Interpretive Center, uh, but to give you some ideas of how that can be done specifically in the context of the site itself. I want to reinforce that. I think Roy really tried to emphasize that. And one other thing I wanted to point out, Roy, before you go away is, is tell us a little bit more about this area, because what I like about this is this is not necessarily, this is kind of the modern part of taking advantage of the history of the power plant. This might be a place for a skateboard park, for example. Right. Um, so, and that's the, yeah. explain how that part of the site could be converted. Well, the uh, particular um, berms around the gas holder tanks uh, are really decrepit, they've been worn down and are no longer capable of holding anything. So they would be cleared away. But in their place, um, you could uh, develop a skateboard park uh, embankments with uh, sloped surfaces, <laughs> just the way any great uh, skateboard park has them. And they would, uh, say, take the form of the former uh, gas tank enclosures so as to kind of carry along a little bit of a, a tradition of, uh, of design there. Uh, it needn't be that way, but uh, we thought that it might be uh, something to talk about. So that uh, is great part of that. Thank you. Now, uh, we're not trying to tell the owner of this property that they need to uh, do a heritage center. Uh, this probably will take some form of public investment and private public-private partnership. Uh, but we felt like uh, this is such an important location that for us to uh, just try and show what a private development would look like wouldn't be appropriate. Uh, this certainly may be sold and somebody may turn this into a purely private proprietary destination, but you can see the, the building itself, that might actually be a restaurant, for example, uh, or could be uh, some hospitality uh, component. So, uh, but we just wanted to, I think, establish a strong vision for how this site could relate specifically to the lake. Um, now, th the other location on the other side of the lake the, what we call the nature and education zone has a lot of complexity too. So Brad's going to talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Roy. And what I'm going to show you real quick is just a, a, a concept really. It's very uh, complex and we really want to spend a little bit more time on it. But one thing I want to focus on is that um, in each of these areas we've kind of created a center which would <laughs> 
would fill voids that might be here now, but would never compete with your existing centers. You already got your convention center, your downtown. So all the things that we're integrating are really trying to actually work with and create nodes of centers throughout the area. And uh, in this area in particular, it seems appropriate to have the nature center in a more natural environment. And currently, it's kind of surrounded by parking. So moving it down to the lower level across from the airport, um, you would actually have a more open area to take what you have and actually expand upon it and create more space for flora and fauna to actually thrive and survive. Um, we've also considered uh, the actual trail system to wrap in orange, you can see in the dashed orange, to wrap along the waterfront and actually connect into Horseshoe Park uh, through a proposed camping area along the Nature Center and then up into uh, uh, was it Mary Ellen Park, Mary Lee Park, sorry. Uh, and then actually attach as a multi-use trail along Knickerbock Knickerbocker Road uh, as you move forward, kind of a complete street approach to Knickerbocker. Yeah, you need to show it. Yep, yeah, show it. So right here, uh, there's actually a, a, ro a roadway access to the airport along this here. So using that same intersection approach, uh, actually move in. Uh, you can have some sort of entry facility or building. Uh, the Nature Center itself could expand to however large it actually needs to be. Um, integrating other uses besides just the Nature Center, you could actually have some uh, some events uh, being hosted there. You can also have some uh, ropes courses and things like that to actually integrate uh, lodging and communities into the Nature Center with multiple events. We're going to develop something much more detailed than this. I, it depends on what you're talking about versus the camping area, the question of whether you could go onto the Bureau of Reclamation land and joint venture, uh, whether or not there would be a zoo component. I mean, these are just things we didn't have time to get into the details of. Um, and also, what we're also going to do is develop a concept related back here. Uh, we're going to show how potential uh, recreational use of Gun Club Hill could be uh, implemented. Again, we just we picked some things that we could show some detail on, and we're going to show a more detailed plan of how this would relate to the uh, potential uh, recreational, different recreational uses of Gun Club Hill. Um, finally, what we wanted to do is show you what's what we're calling Harborside Village. Again, this may uh, take uh, the shape of a different name, but this is the last section we wanted to show you and then uh, look forward to any comments you might have. So Millsoft's going to talk about some of the details of what we've developed here uh, and then uh, we'll uh, close for any comments or questions. Thank you, Scott. Since I roughly belong to Roy's generation, I say roughly because although I have whiter hair, he's older than I am. Uh, I may have a problem with the computer, too, but uh, uh, Joseph Campbell, a famous mythologist, said, I can, uh, in an interview with Bill Morris, said, I can mythologize the computer for you. And he said, what do you mean? He said, computers are like an Old Testament God, a lot of rules and no mercy. So anyway, I'll see. Let me see. Okay, I got it. Uh, one of the uh, concerns that you expressed early in, the, in this process and one of our challenges has actually been to develop areas with some high degree of urbanity uh, and at the same time preserve the existing, uh, the character of the existing neighborhoods. And by urbanity, we all talk about urban, but I don't know if we all really understand what we mean. By urbanity, degree of urbanity, I mean the number of unscheduled human interactions you run, you, you run into in an area. So if you if you're in a, a low urban area, then you have very few interactions. If you're a high urban area, you have higher degree of urbanity. <coughs> so this is one of those areas we felt uh, uh, that is actually next to the road and uh, doesn't uh, endanger, uh, I, I would say, the existing character and privacy of the, of the neighborhoods that are there already. This uh, seemingly uh, circle, which now looks like an ellipse, Anyway, it represents 10 minutes of walking from one into the other. That's like a half a mile. So this, the distance from here to here is about a half a mile. And the other half of Mary Lee Park is another half a mile. 
And one of the major strokes that we are proposing here is to introduce three different access points to, to this harbor village. One uh, at Lakeshore Boulevard, one at uh, South Concha Drive, and the third one, which uh, doesn't really match any street over here, which would be more private for the residents that already have houses in there. So the first one would actually um, uh, serve as an access to the new hotel or portion of a hotel. We've discussed a couple of concepts, a hotel entirely on this side or hotel par partly on this side and partly on the other side of, uh, of Nikibaka Road. Uh, the other one would be entrance to the beach with a maybe a slight uh, small uh, roundabout with an uh, obelisk or a sign and with a pavilion with restrooms and, and other uh, facilities necessary for the beach. And the third one would be uh, almost a private entrance for the residents that already uh, live in the area. Uh, the other major stroke, I would say, is the creation of this line of buildings which would act as a backdrop, uh, being maybe four, maybe five stories tall, from which people would actually have a wonderful view of the lake. And, oops, sorry. There I go. No rules. Uh, I mean, a lot of rules. Uh, <coughs> and the... Uh, Ultimately, the effect of, of this development here, where you have uh, lower buildings on this side and higher buildings on this side, would be that this is actually one of the uh, much more effective ways to create a gateway to the city of San Angelo than just putting a couple of pilots on either side of the street or the road. Uh, so the way this works is when you come in here uh, to the beach, there's like a boulevard en a type entry, then there's a parking for the beach over here. The beach is right there. And uh, we are proposing that we introduce a splash playground over here, a splash park, whatever it's called, which is already a part of this, uh, if you want, uh, you know, loud noises to some degree, you know, group of people. But to me, the, the sound of children playing uh, is probably one of the best signs of life in the community. So I hope you're not too offended by that. And uh, over here next to the hotel, we have a conference center with, uh, with uh, some parking for it. Well, the most of the parking for the hotel is actually on this side. And some, uh, a, a boardwalk with a marina for uh, transients, a uh, small plaza, and some shops and, and restaurants on, on the boardwalk. <coughs> Should I go to the next one? Hey, let, me, let me reinforce something here real quick. Since this is parkland here, excuse me, Melissa, off. This could be an extension of the hotel with some villas or, or right. single, uh, uh, single uh, uh, building uh, for, uh, for rent uh, hospitality units. And then over here, this could be uh, uh, permanent housing or, uh, or hotels, both. Uh, and then the parking is hidden between each of these. So, this is, so there may be some concern about how, to, how this could be parked, but the detail uh, that you will see is that, that these buildings that Millisoft has designed are all very parkable, plus creating more parking for the uh, destination traffic that would be coming to the beach, coming to the marina, uh, and coming to the restaurants. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, an added benefit to this is actually, as you know, there's a neighborhood that exists already here. And I think by putting this, uh, I mean, Locating these buildings uh, as they are, we are an anticipating or planning to have retail on the bottom, at least in this on this intersection, so that some of the services can be provided for the people who already live there. Uh, the uh, yeah, okay, we'll go to the next one. Uh, this shows in a little more detail our attempt to preserve or protect the community that already exists there. In, in other words, the houses that are very near the beach and the ones that you first get to. Uh, right now, this road goes directly. We recommend a loop with a uh, park that is improved, densified perhaps with a sign or a statue or something uh, there to further uh, suggest that this is a private area and that, uh, you know, and, and the road itself allowed actually passage from the beach down to these houses without really having to go, you know, closer, close to these homes. I wonder what they're doing here. Okay. Don't touch the button. Okay. See? Uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is we, 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 we propose to introduce a, what we call a slip street, 
which is actually a median between a two-way road uh, and a one-lane road from which uh, all of these uh, lots would have a private entry, pretty much. So, uh, and this entrance, like I said, you know, th although the uh, ramp, uh, the boat ramp is still here and we're proposing a, sail a sailing school on this location, which is going to be a very unassuming low building because of the path, uh, flight path, which is actually right here. Uh, they still do not really disturb people that are further down uh, along the uh, Fisherman's Road. I don't know if you can see this, but one of the things we wanted to point out in this uh, sketch is the connection that it would be possible uh, by extension of the uh, Lakeshore Boulevard all the way down to, to connect with South Concha Street that would then bring this area uh, actually a lot closer and easier uh, to enjoy all of these amenities. And one of the suggestions there, one of uh, the uh, uh, was MFA, the consultants but that, that, that are left yesterday, that they made a suggestion that we possibly consider a complex of soccer fields that will bring additional families. Uh, and as you see, this is not very far. That, that's just on the edge of the five minutes of walking from, from the center of this. So that's another interesting possibility to, that we can use this not just for itself but to improve the mobility and the service distribution for the surrounding areas. Thank you, Milsoff. I also want to stress that when we've shown the extension of the road, it is through property, uh, and we're not suggesting that 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 be done uh, other than through any kind of negotiation or purchase of that property and it does follow the parcel lines uh, so uh, if it's feasible and we haven't fully investigated it uh, it would open up access to parcels without going through uh, and damaging the uh, the essential character of the parcels that are there to the south so with that we uh, that's a lot of information uh, we did as much as we could the last couple days uh, like I said, we still are going to develop some detail uh, for the community activity area. Uh, and we're going to also show a more uh, comprehensive uh, plan to show how we could integrate both uh, Gun Club Hill and the uh, 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 power plant site uh, with an integrated recreational uh, destination using the vertical aspects of Gun Club Hill. Uh, n n no snowboarding, uh, artificial snowboarding though. I think that one's, that one's off the table pretty quickly. But, but uh, certainly there's a lot of other great ideas and zip lines and connections and uh, trails and, and, and mountain biking and there's a lot of options and we'll develop a detailed concept for that. Um, so with that, um, we're ready to open up for any questions or comments unless anybody else on our team has any last minute information. Nope. I hope you can see that we've really tried our hardest to take advantage of the natural lake, uh, uh, low impact, uh, local recreation. Uh, that's what we heard regularly from folks, but I think at the same time it sets the stage for the expanding national brand that you all are developing as, uh, for this as a destination uh, for competitions, for uh, action sports, uh, and uh, we think both can be accomplished. Um, but it has to be planned, it has to be executed in coordination, uh, and then some decisions have to be made in terms of the priorities for the essential infrastructure uh, that would be necessary to catalyze uh, uh, this activity or to reinforce what's already happening that you guys like. So, please, if, if you could step up to the microphone, it's, please. <laughs> we, we'll, we'll, we'll take the time to have everybody speak who wants to. Well, good evening, my name is Louis Pettis. I'm chairman of the San Angelo uh, Recreation Advisory Board, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, and so. Uh, Great, I'm glad you're here. Thank you, thank you. So I just had a couple of, on the Harbor Village part, I noticed that we're going to be moving a lot more into that area. And what traffic studies, or would there be any traffic studies done? Because that's a highly, with that all that new 
coming into it, and that's a very dangerous curve coming from the bridge into that area. Sure. There may be some, I don't know what, traffic studies or if that was taken into consideration. Well, we didn't do traffic well, studies. And that, well, that's <laughs> kind of just thinking <laughs> in the future. Right? Sure, you'd have to do traffic studies. Right, right. Well, we as, we talk, as we've as we already talked, it's critical that that Knickerbocker, we, that we work with TxDOT and look at right. a redesign of Knickerbocker. Right. Um, you can slow the speeds down and still have the capacity to move a lot of traffic. In fact... Uh, traffic flow studies show that traffic moves most efficiently in terms of numbers at around 35 to 40 miles an hour, uh, right. unless you want it to unless you want it to function like a highway. Uh, and this is no longer just a uh, low uh, a low intensity uh, rural roadway anymore. There's right. a lot of activity out here. Right. So the design and function of Knickerbocker through here is now a mismatch for what it's really becoming. Right. And if you want, and I'm assuming that's what your implication is, if you want this destination to occur, there's a lot of capacity on that roadway. We just went, I should have shown this, I, I forgot to put it in, but we just went through the similar exercise. We'll put this as an example in the final report. We're Park Road 100 through Padre. We mm -hmm. just did a redevelopment plan for Padre Island and work with TxDOT for reinvention of the design of Padre Boulevard. And we went from a five lane uh, with a middle chicken laying in environment and the concept that TxDOT's approved to a four lane median divided uh, with uh, color integrated uh, bike lanes and oh, nice. parking uh, to slow the traffic down, but to maintain the ability for the high capacity of the amount of traffic, but to make it safer and more appropriate for people to actually be doing things and hanging out on the, on, on, on the uh uh, the areas adjacent to the roadway. Um, we don't think that this will ever really reinvent itself under this kind of vision unless there's a concerted effort to reinvent the function and design of Knickerbocker through that area, especially because of your point. Right. When you come across the bridge and with that skew, the, 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 the angle, uh, it, it, if you did, if you just tried to put more activity there without really looking at the roadway itself, it would be even more dangerous. Right. And then the next question I had was on the um, heritage <coughs> center. It, if that's a private public collaboration. Well, I think it would have to be. It, right. I, mean, I think it would have to be. I mean, I'll just jump to the bottom line there. I think this is something where you'd have to have uh, private fundraising. Uh, I don't think there would be any for profit interest that could do this and raise money just purely on a proprietary basis. And I don't think the public sector would be in a position, nor would it be appropriate, to purely fund it. So I think you'd have to find somebody who would. And one of the things is that there are heritage interpretive centers that are actually generating uh, significant levels of cash flow for certain components. Um, uh, but I think that this would be something that you could go out and have a, cam uh, a, a, a charitable fundraising campaign for, uh, just like you have for museums and other uh, civic activities where you could have a combination of, of proprietary and private investment, uh, potentially some brownfield or federal government uh, funding and maybe some local funding for the essential uh, access elements and then some uh, privately raised money uh, for the, for the uh, public good for this to be uh, an activity. So from your experience then, would it be privately run or would it be, the, would the city then have to kind of put that in their budget, I mean, or with the rec department. Well, a lot of these kinds of facilities, oftentimes you get private foundations and private nonprofits that end up running them. Okay. Uh, you certainly would want to make sure that you wouldn't put an additional burden on the city if this was something that made sense. And uh, there are, uh, and, and, and Roy or Johanna, you, you can speak to this if you want to, but there are lots of ways to program these interpretive centers where there's actually revenue that can be generated from the activities so that it's potentially underwritten by the activity itself and not uh, fully just something that requires uh, a subsidy. Um, but I think it would have to be a very carefully woven together partnership of a lot of different uh, sources. Uh, but um, that's how great civic destinations have been undertaken for sure, generations. Sure. But yeah, I, the, what we're not recommending is the city take on a public obligation to make this happen uh, without some sort of capacity from the private sector or the nonprofit sector to actually take on the risk. Okay. I just want to Here, you need to, you need to, uh, hold on. Hold. just wanted to add that the uh, nonprofit uh, component of the formula really can yield very, very 
good and important results. Um, in uh, Canyon, that nonprofit 501c3 was formed, and they drew upon donations from many, many sectors, including industry, agriculture, and so forth. Here in San Angelo, you have uh, important uh, oil shell activity centers and headquarters of companies that deal with drilling and extraction and so forth. Uh, you have uh, a wind turbine company. You have other um, areas in sectors and businesses and industries that could also become quite interested in a heritage center of this type, uh, components of which are going to be talking about their industries, their products, their progress through time and so forth. So I think there is a um, natural tie, a linkage let's call it, between uh, your economic sector, your business sector, your industrial sector, and the nonprofit sector and whatever that new foundation uh, could do in terms of talking with those uh, business sectors. Um, there's no promise to anything in this, but this sure. is the way many other cities move, and I hope you might explore that as well. Last question. <laughs> the boat ramps and everything that was incorporated when the when the lake was originally built and everything and, and, and the infrastructure that's now being, that's you mentioned earlier, that needs to be the upkeep of it. Would the trails and the parks, the new park, would that, would that be open area just so that it's open to the public or would that yeah. we need to? No, I think that I think the trail system and, and, and uh, we, we realize that the trail, the, uh, creating an integrated trail system that that would circle the lake is a, is a long term project. I'll tell you that in the city of Austin around Town Lake, downtown, the uh, Town Lake trail system started in the 1970s with Lady Bird Johnson and the city just passed another bond measure to add the next segment. They've been working on it for 25 years. It is a great trail system, but it's been a long-term uh, uh, investment. And we're talking about a lot of trails here, uh, but, the, but the usage <coughs> and the need is clear to us. There is no doubt when, when folks are out on an asphalt road in 100 degrees in the summer and it gets the kind of use that it does, if we could create a positive trail space that was safe and usable, it would, it would serve the community. So I, I think that it, it, when, you, when I think of this trail system, we're thinking about Town Lake and Austin, maybe at least I am. I don't know that the rest of the team does, but I think of it, which is an open, public, free <coughs> trail system that's got great stops. It's got restrooms along the way. There's water fountains along the way. It's been uh, landscaped, so there's shade because Austin is as hot as San Angelo in the summer. And uh, it's taken a lot of years, but it's a beautiful trail system, and it's bikes, it's walking and jogging all on the same trail, strollers, kids, the whole thing. And it's wide enough to do that. And that's kind of what I think conceptually is going on. Well, to reinforce that, if you look on this slide that was the initial and assessment done by our, our colleagues at MFA, don't, don't turn it off. Um, uh, <laughs> I did that the last time, remember, and I got in trouble. So. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you, Peter. No, but if you look at this slide, this is selected possible lake-related activities. They did an initial demand assessment. Look at the column here, under 25 miles, it shows that the number one by number of people that are currently uh, interested or, in, or, 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 or likely to uh, recreate through walking for exercise, 23,000 people. It's the number one thing. It's, it's almost five times as much as people uh, are demand or would look for or, or, or would be active in, in boating. Um, so uh, I think that reinforces that uh, this is certainly something that needs to be a priority and it's certainly something that we've heard. Now, that is an activity because you would not want to charge for access. Uh, that is an activity that would likely fall quintessentially uh, under either the public's purview or through uh, as uh, uh, Lady Bird Lake Trail has been a combination of privately raised money. Um, you know, part of what we're going to recommend is some capacity to use the foundation and right now the foundation is just basically looking at long-term capacity uh, f f using the funds as the uh, uh, the uh, leasehold interests are transferred over to private fee interest for the homeowners in the area but in a sense if you think about it the foundation has and working with other organizations such as the uh, park advisory committee 
has the opportunity to, co- to create a much broader mandate in terms of a uh, capacity uh, to go out and have capital campaigns uh, from a nonprofit perspective. Because businesses are not in the position to invest in those essential common uh, elements such as a trail system. I mean, it's just, they'll, they'll build a hotel, but they're, they're not going to invest in that common element, which uh, is ultimately either got to be a combination of public investment and nonprofit investment. Uh, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the boat ramp issue, because obviously when we talk about boat ramps, we're really talking about water level. And we're talking about the investment required. We, our firm does a lot of work on boat ramps and park wildlife boat ramp grants and design and permitting and construction of those. Uh, in, in, in the comments and in the discussions that we had, there was a sense that, boy, this is all wonderful stuff y'all are coming up with here. And it looks great and be really super duper. But uh, you know, if this lake isn't at a level that functions, there doesn't make any sense to talk about any of it. In other words, there's this precursor, there's this precondition uh, that ought to be addressed, right? And it's almost like it makes no sense to think beyond that problem. Now, I'll tell you just on a personal note, I, I disagree with that notion. And I don't know what the value of investment is around the lake right now, but almost every foot of waterfront available for development on the lake is built, right? Would we say about 80 plus percent, probably 90 I don't know what the, if it's a billion dollars or two billion dollars of private investment value on the lake right now. All of that investment occurred in the private sector without the full resolution of this very important question on the, on the lake. I'm not saying that the town should ignore it. I think the town has to get aggressive and serious about water level, dredging, <coughs> shoreline condition, and stormwater runoff and sedimentation. These are big questions, as I say, they're technical and they're engineering. I don't think the town should surrender the initiative on the kinds of exciting opportunities here to the idea that we cannot think that through until we have a complete and full resolution of the water issue. As, and I think it, that, we're, as everybody said to us, we're in the desert. Understand we're in an arid area. Understand what this lake, how this lake functions. We do understand it. But I think there are moving ahead with the planning and implementation at the same time that you're aggressively addressing sedimentation and water levels and water quality and that slate sl- sl- of issues is what, 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 what I believe is the appropriate tactic. Uh, because we wouldn't say to the private sector, forget building another house, forget buying another lot, forget spending another dollar, uh, this lake is going to be used and the, and the private sector is going to continue to expand investment on this water and it can be done in an organized way that provides broader benefits for the community or not. And we feel like you got to take the opportunity to integrate some of this, the real asset. That's just my personal speech on that issue. Appreciate that. I, I think that's part of our job is to is to try and catalyze and rationalize the policy discussions. Um, a lot of planning consultants believe that their job is to be neutral. I think it's our job to absorb what we've heard and and, and, and then provide some opinions. And so you may not agree with what Peter said, but but hopefully what we're doing is helping you to really frame the issues because you're never going to have consensus on how to resolve all of them. It's not possible, uh, but you could you could do what I characterize as something called informed consent, which is you may have some people that disagree ultimately with certain decisions, but they are informed as to why that decision was made, and they ultimately consent to what the decision is, even though they may not agree to it. And I think that's really the concept that you all should look at in terms of resolving some of these policy issues related to the lake in terms of what should be invested in, uh, what orders you take some of these things up in, is if you wait for consensus, you'll never do anything because you'll never all agree. So our job is to help you figure out what is the informed consent opportunity, not the consensus opportunity. So that's our that's our uh, frick and frack uh, 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 soapbox for a sec. Uh, that's absolutely outside of our scope of work. <laughs>
Anybody else? I'm Kerry <coughs> Cleland. I'm with the Contra Valley Archery Association, and I'm also a resident of this area. My first question is, is there a way that we can get a copy of this PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, well, two, two things. One, it's on the city's laptop. Uh, we'd be happy to make sure that you have access to it. Uh, and if a, you, anybody has a stick, we'll put it up. Uh, AJ, can we put it up on the website? It'll go up on the website by tomorrow. Oh, and if anybody has a stick and you want to get a copy tonight, uh, absolutely. Now, um, I want to qualify something. Uh, what you see here, some of it is on private property. Uh, some of it is uh, uh, on lands that may have already been designated in other plans in the, of the city for different things. These are concepts. These are ideas. Uh, uh, whether or not we could ever talk about doing a roundabout and text out right away, you know, is, is a long discussion. But what we want to do is to really push the envelope and put out there some strong ideas and I hope most of you look at this and go, actually, a lot of that is, you know, germinated from the discussions that I had with these guys and gals. So I just want to make sure that you understand, please, if you work with somebody else and they didn't see this presentation, they get a hold of this. I think it's really, really important. In fact, I'm going to put on here, I'm going to put a little, before I let anybody have a copy, I'm going to put on the first slide uh, for illustrative purposes only. So. Um. I just want to thank you guys for allowing uh, the Archery Club to be a voice in all this. Uh, we sure. really appreciate that. We've been a pleasure working with you guys, and we hope that a lot of this does come to uh, fruition. Uh, my second concern is, have you guys come up with any type of game management plan? Uh, there's a tremendous amount of deer, turkey, javelina, other animals that come or utilize the area for water. And as we increase the utilization of that area, and it's never a good thing that happens when man and nature collide. Uh, increased traffic, we've got a lot of deer. It means a lot more accidents, deer being killed on the road. Uh, sure. The heritage area that you're talking about how, or is home to a herd of about 20 deer. Uh, the areas around Spring Creek are just overrun with deer, turkey, and other animals. Have you guys thought about high f or capturing the animals, relocating them, putting up a high fence to prevent them from uh, coming back into the area? Or have you guys got another plan? Well, we don't have a plan. Um, that, that, that issue is in the same category as the issue of water quality and maintenance of the lake. It's not something that we're in a position to tackle in this particular effort but i made a note those are two areas that we're going to write about in the report frame the issues and make sure that there's institutional memory that both have to be dealt with for long-term success uh, we're, we're, we're not in a position to to resolve those in this work but we will absolutely uh, make sure that we capture and document and frame those issues so that as the vision and the details of something such as a uh, shared destination trailhead for uh, uh, for uh, the uh, neighborhood and for the archery club and for the disc golf folks uh, with uh, restroom facilities and all the rest come to life, uh, that the more uh, long-term but less sexy issues are also captured so that people understand that this won't happen if those aren't dealt with. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Paul Alexander, uh, City Council SMD1. Uh, Scott, I wanted to, to, you were describing this concept and how rudimentary it is, and, and you're th really what we're doing is thinking out of the box. This has happened before in San Angelo. Uh, RUDET, it's uh, the, the Regional Urban Design Assistance Team, came here in 1992, and they really, they did this kind of stuff for downtown and how the fort plugs into the river and, and it was all conceptual and, and from that, we've gone a long way. And this is a really developed uh, and everything's starting to connect together downtown with the fort and the museum was built. That's what it's about. So you guys are breaking the barriers, saying look what you could do. And from that, we can begin to think clear and, and confidently that we're on the right path. 
and, and that's where we're at right now, so that we can uh, develop out the lake in a, in a smart way. Planning is never a bad thing. Did you, did, you, did you say that to me? That was somebody else. It was, uh, it was Bill Ayler. That's who it was. And uh, that's what it was. Cause I think but, there's but, some but underlying gives me, uh, messages going but on But Gene gives me lots of good advice, so I assumed it came from him. Just That was a knee <laughs> jerk reaction. But uh, the, the lake has never been this designed before, never really been looked at like this. So this is going to really help us uh, come together and, and, and paddle in the same direction, so to speak. Well, I appreciate that. I, I think our job, first and foremost, for you, because people have asked us, why are we doing this? Why has the city hired you? And I think it's exactly that point. We are the integrators. Uh, it's hard for the local um, interest to oftentimes do that themselves. Sometimes you need an outside force to come in because we didn't get the memo that we weren't supposed to talk about how certain things can be related or how certain groups need to work together or how certain parcels need to actually function as a single organism. And so hopefully what we've done is done exactly that, is set the stage to break down some of the barriers that may exist today in terms of how those conversations might go forward. So I do agree. I think we're first and foremost, um, uh, our role is, yes, everybody has to do good planning because the technical side has to be uh, 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 strong and stand on its own two feet but hopefully what we've also done is provided the opportunity for y'all to have conversations about the integration more easily than before we came i appreciate that anybody else y'all want to say anything no you guys want to comment no nope. no nope. oh okay well listen uh again to the uh, uh, if anybody wants to send us additional comments, uh, send them to the city, to AJ. AJ, I'm sorry, I don't have your email memorized. Oh, my goodness. Does somebody, you guys have it there. Brad, you have it memorized, don't you? Thank you, AJ. That's okay. Um, we can be reached a variety of different ways. You can find us on uh, Twitter, Facebook, Lake Nasworthy Plan. You can also look on our city's website under uh, sanangelotexas.us slash planning, and there is a link to our email there, and we will respond to all of those accordingly. We look forward to hearing from all of you, and thank you for your attendance. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good night. <laughs>